So in two late 12th century or early 13th century sermon manuscripts, sections of which are copies of Anglo-Saxon homilies, there appears a short treatise explicating Psalm 126.6 in the Vulgate Psalms 125.6-7, which in the Douay Rance translation is, going they went and wept, casting their seeds, but coming they shall come with joyfulness, carrying their sheaves. The entire text occupies just over three sides of the manuscripts. After an opening discussion of the verse, the homilist draws four specific, largely biblical links to explain situations of tears and weeping, to Mary Maudlin's tears as she washed Christ's feet, to Christ's tears as he raised Lazarus from the dead out of compassion for Martha and Mary, to the tears of Job and David as they presented their disgust with the world and their desire to leave this strange land, and to the tears of every righteous man who wishes to go to heaven and send forth himself his hot to us. The last section of the text, just before the ending in which, unlike in the last section, they all did go straight to salvation, um, but the last section of the text, just before that um, ending, is, as it appears in the Lambeth homilies, item 17, as edited by Richard Morris, states, and this is the handout that some of you have access to, um, and I'm not going to read my translation, I'm just going to read the, the Middle English, which I'm going to read like an Anglo-Saxonist. <laughs> the terror that man shared for his M. Christinus sona is in eminent snow water, for it melt of the nature horta swadeth the snow unto Eunice the sona. And I'm going to just skip the Latin for now. The terror that man webbeth for lava of this lever is in eminent well of water, for he welleth of the hot swadeth water of well. The terror that man webbeth for longing at all heaven is in eminent dow water, for elsewhere saith the sona drach up sene dow. And Marcus Sar of Kumarenus, swa Marcus the Haliagast the man the halder not to hovena, and when a hen a may thither kuma, alzarala se he walda, he sent thither his heart to Terus. Moritz, Morris, in his translation, omits the reference to the prophet Isaiah as the origin of this exegesis, presumably because he, like me, could not find such a passage anywhere in the biblical book. The same material occurs also in the Trinity homilies, also edited by Morris, in a somewhat expanded form. At the end of this lengthier exposition, the homilist states that St. James experienced these four kinds of tears, and the congregation must now follow this example. As a result, Morris titles the homily, number 25 in the Trinity manuscript, as being for St. James. The revised and expanded Trinity version improves in many ways on the Lambeth homily with added poignant details. For example, the first kind of tears is given two biblical explanations as Peter's tears at his denial of Christ are added to Mary Maudlin's tears while washing his feet. And in the final explanation of the four kinds of water, this weeping is specified as that which an individual does concerning his or her own sins, which is therefore very bitter, like salt water, thus the tears of seawater. The exegesis of tears in these two homilies is both clever and sophisticated. Moving through Augustine's four levels of exegesis seamlessly and potently, the Old Testament and the New Testament appear, as does an application which is specifically allegorical and tied to Christ, and the adagogical application to the life of every righteous Christian individual. Complex and elegant, the passage is also touching and quite beautiful. It offers a charming and deeply moving approach to the compunction of the soul, which demonstrates itself in the gift of four kinds of tears. Where this exegesis came from and whether and how it cast its influence in English religious de devotion is my initial concern here. The specific context of this treatise has been much discussed in recent years since what I think of as the third wave of concern with the 12th century broke upon the field of medieval English studies. The first wave, I've been sort of figuring three waves of feminism, but three waves of the 12th century here. The first wave being the historian Charles Homer Haskins' evocation in 1927 of a 12th century renaissance of vigorous new life for architecture, literature, iconography, and everyday living. And the second, lamenting the failure of the first wave to take hold. And you 
now see parallel to feminism, being the collection by Giles Constable and Robert Benson on Renaissance and Renewal in the 12th Century, published in 1982. As with other third waves, this third wave of 12th century appro approaches rejects the sense of rupture and new life invoked in the first two waves in favor of anchoring the English 12th century in its Anglo-Saxon past and arguing for a much closer connection between late Old English texts and their copying and reworking in the 12th and early 13th centuries. There have been a number of elements to this third and highly English rediscovery of the 12th century, including a preliminary collection of essays, a conference, and at least one major research grant. The culmination of the current wave appears to be the work of Elaine Trahar and Mary Swan and oriented a role in their online project entitled The Production of Use of English Manuscripts, 1060 to 1220. The three scholars argue implicitly against the traditional notion of a rupture at the Norman Conquest, after which the scriptoria were purged of their fusty Anglo-Saxons and replaced with the cold and clear thoughts of Norman monastics. <laughs> <laughs> Old vernacular sermons jettisoned in favor of new European thinking in Latin and so forth. Trahar and Swan and DeRold present very detailed codological investigations of the manuscripts in English in England for the first 150 years of Norman and Plantagenet rule so that new initiatives in manuscript layout can be analyzed and the continuing presence of Anglo-Saxon materials placed in a more coherent context. Their work remains deeply significant, its tendrils of meaning as yet not fully analyzed. However, both Traharn and Swan have published separately on both the Lambeth and Trinity homilies, and footnotes in their work suggest that Swan intends an edition of the Lambeth manuscript, I hovered over in tens, because I think it maybe should be in ten dead. Um, she's apparently gone into the church, <sighs> sadly. Um, well, Traharn <laughs> is working on a Trinity manuscript. Um, Swan, in particular, has studied the contents of both manuscripts in some detail in the context of her extensive studies of preaching after the Norman Conquest. She identifies 15 manuscripts produced between the later 11th century and early 13th century, which include Old English homilies, and notes that these manuscripts, although they contained homilies, could do so for private devotional purposes as well as for public preaching. Thus, she constructs Lambeth 487, this manuscript, as being devotional texts of a variety of kinds, some framed with the rhetorical markers of homilies and others not. Moreover, she argues that the first 18 items, all written by the same scribe around the year 1200, were all created by the same mind as well. That is to say, she argues that one individual reworked earlier materials in various ways through the first 18 texts, reframing and rewriting along the way. Thus, in addition to the texts early in the manuscript identified by others as copies or adaptations of Alfrician material, she argues that items 9, 10, and 11, and perhaps others as well, are adapted reconstructions of homilies by Alfrich, even suggesting that these texts might not have been reworked from a written original, but were memorialized reconstructions. Moreover, oddities of compilation and copying errors suggest, she argues, that the whole manuscript was created by the preacher who planned to use it, outside a major center or scriptorium, offering cues for further oral development rather than an entire script for the homilies to read, for the homilist to read. Although Swan notes the earlier arguments of Celia Sizem, which divide the text in the Lambeth manuscript broadly into two groups of apparently Anglo-Saxon material and apparently Norman material, she implies that the entire manuscript is the work of a late 12th century English-speaking cleric written from memory or from other texts by that one individual to provide what she loosely terms materials for devotion or for preaching or both. Swan doesn't quite say this, but she comes very close. And in a separate article, this one concerning what she calls mobile libraries in the West Midlands of Worcester, she explicitly states that Lambeth 487 is an example of ongoing activity in post-conquest West Midlands Old English manuscript production. She believes that the pre-conquest materials in this manuscript are there in a way which implies that those materials had never gone out of circulation and that it, the Lambeth manuscript, could not have been made without a pre-existing ongoing capacity to compose and recopy Old English. Elsewhere, Swan proposes that in addition to this ongoing capacity to compose Old English, there are cases of texts newly composed in English after 1066 of which literary style and sensibilities, as well as the language, fit much more closely with Old English traditions than with Middle English ones. Among the texts that Swan cites in this category 
is the aforementioned rhyming paternoster and some other of the Old English affiliated items in the Lambeth holiday, homilies. On five items, she argues carefully that although the Christocentric devotion that they move towards did occur in late pre-conquest texts, these texts gather momentum in the Henrician period and are more a feature of post-conquest Old and Middle English, she starts to align them, rather than pre-conquest Old English literary traditions. In other words, though Swan is careful to assign these five items to a kind of intermediate category, she implies that the other 13 items in the Lambeth homilies are primarily and principally Anglo-Saxon in conception. These five texts are common to the Lambeth homilies and the Trinity homilies. Swan notes elsewhere well that, as well that the five texts in common between the two manuscripts, of which this treatise is one in our total focus here today, do not appear to derive from Anglo-Saxon originals, at least not, and she carefully adds this, surviving Anglo-Saxon texts. This is more or less the point I reached when I was submitting the abstract for this paper, which is why it has the title that it did. Um, <laughs> I then did the kind of thing that you do at Western. I paused, thought about the paper was, thought about the focus of this conference, and I asked myself the classic University of Western Ontario question, what would Richard do? <laughs> <laughs> this, this might be also an Ohio State University question. I don't know. speak for Western. Um, and the first answer that came to me was read everything in all the footnotes of all of the papers I have read to this point and everything else that I can find. So, and the second answer was. <laughs> The second answer was, start reading all 11th and 12th century Latin texts available in English to find the source. So I went, went naturally with answer number two, because I'm nuts, um, and because you could do it online. So I then spent you know, many long hours with the Fontes Anglo-Saxonici to absolutely no avail whatsoever. And then I went to work with Patrilonia Latina, and after um, a few extremely frustrating hours, I came up with something that I thought, oh, well, that's nuts. Um, so I went back to answer number one, and we'll come back to the that's nots part. Other texts in both manuscripts are Alfretian. Um, Celia Sizem, and this is where I went back to the earlier stuff from the footnotes, Celia Sizem was the first to point out, followed by Swan, that the copies and redevelopments of homilies by Alfrich are a separate set in the Lambeth manuscript. Sizem has three subsets, Swan is less particular. Alfrich in general seems to attract post-conquest annotation and updating, both by the tremendous hand of Worcester and in other manuscripts copied and used after the conquest. His texts appear, according to Sizem, who indicates that she's following Morris, um, in items 1 through 5 and 9 through 13 in the Lambeth homilies. Sizem notes orthographical evidence which separates the Alfrician group from what she calls group B, um, which is the five items we're talking about, items 7, 8, 14 through 17 in the 18th work. Six, okay, I'm not gonna worry about it. She excludes item six, oh, there it is, a rhyming and non-alliterative poem on the pattern Noster, um, which Swan and Morris both assigned to the first group of specifically Anglo-Saxon and clearly Alfretian works, both because orthographically it has elements of both groups and because its use of rhyme makes it unlikely to be Anglo-Saxon in origin. But we Anglo-Saxonists, we've started to claim bits of rhyme in these respects, it matches the last of the 18 original items in the manuscript, the poem of Morale, although the scribe breaks off in the middle of this text, leaving room for the end. The other texts in Sizem's group B are, in her analysis, not Anglo-Saxon in origin. And she says, it is unlikely that any of the sermons from group B was derived from an Old English version. And then she sticks in parentheses, some were perhaps translated from Latin in the 12th century. Sizem's further conclusions largely agree with Swan's argument that the dialectal and orthographical evidence suggests that group A is from an older but not wholly linguistically different tradition than group B, that the scribe copying this material from two source manuscripts probably did revise and update the language so that a dialect coloring of the West Midlands was imposed on the entire text as first written, and that the material was intended for a preacher. Unlike Swan, she argues for a letter-for-letter -letter scribal tradition of copying and adduces various examples where the scribe of 1200, or in her view, slightly later, had trouble understanding the letter forms of the copy text. There were lots of other pieces to read, but this was the salient one by Celia. So my next question, of course, was what 
what you do now. Um, so I thought, well, he's going to dig some more on the manuscript because you know that that whole pro project on manuscripts. He's going to go back and dig some more. Um, and so I went digging, and I discovered an article by Ralph Hanna. Um, intriguingly, he follows directly from Celia Sizem, stating that in his after his preliminary description of the manuscript in his context that. The book is the product, he says, of literatum copying, brilliantly reconstructed in Sizem's study. He agrees with her argument for two discontinuous sources and argues further that her largely orthographical argument replicates itself in the shifts in copying procedure that are to be identified in the production of the book. Hannah corrects the collation of the manuscript by M.R. James, arguing for six squires and proposing that the original plan for largely Old English material had been added to and expanded sequentially. In other words, the manuscript developed as a series of accretions. The text, which is my concern, the treatise on tears, falls specifically at the end of Hannah's choir five, folios 57 verso to 59 verso. The copying practice in this choir, with a full 29 lines on a small page and the length of the copying line expanded at both margins to fit in all of items 14 to 17, suggests to Hannah that this section was also intended to be discreet and sufficient unto itself. Hannah concludes that Lambeth 487 has been pieced together out of at least two pre-existing books, supplemented sequentially as additional interesting exemplars became available. Hannah sees a compiler impelled by expediency, seizing and copying with appropriate changes to dialect and language use, texts that seemed appropriate and useful. Moreover, Hannah's title of his article, which is specifically an early 13th century manuscript, <coughs> indicates that he sees the manuscript as wholly of the early 13th century, placing it firmly in a Middle English context, not an afterlife of pre-conquest materials, but judging by his final comparison of the Lambeth homilies with the copying procedures in British Library and his Titus D 18, which is a manuscript many of you probably know with a copy of the Ancre and Wissa and three of the Catherine group texts. He sees it as a Middle English compendium of useful texts found along the way. So now we have a slightly later date for the Lambeth homilies. We're shading over 1200. Um, we have lots of other research going on and we have a firm placement of the manuscript in the world of Middle English. Um, not the world that Anglo-Saxonists like to construct in which there's rupture in everything else but sermons wander right along over the conquest. <laughs> um, you know, R.M. Wilson's tradition um, in, in his book on early Middle English actually calls the chapter on sermons the continuity of the Anglo-Saxon sermon. Um, so I once again ask myself what would Richard do now? Um, and what we have here is an exegesis of tears. Richard would immediately, well, okay, well, th this is Richard, right? He'd probably go back and study the physiology of tears. But I'm not going there. I never would. Um, but how tears were configured in Anglo-Saxon England and how tears were configured in Middle English, yes, he would do that. And sadly, you're not going to hear about that. So you're not going to hear about the two instances in Beowulf in which there are tears but have spawned three articles um, out of the five written about tears in all of Anglo-Saxon England. Um, you're not even going to hear about the fact that there's actually only 12 instances of tears in all of Old English poetry, which when you think about all the weeping and lamentation that goes on, is a bit striking. Um, and you're definitely not going to hear about Marjorie Kent's gift of tears because that would be too exciting for you all. Um, <laughs> of the saints or for the individual feeling compunction. These are later developments of tears. Our little treatise clearly functions in a quite different tradition, though a highly sophisticated one which certainly has elements of this kind of affective piety. The opening sections of the sermon quote the tears of Christ and the tears of the Virgin Mary in the New Testament and place the exegesis of tears in this homily specifically within the context of the biblical models for compunction. The images for the exegesis of tears here, however, are about efficacy and not mystical devotion, the practical bathing of the soul with four kinds of tears in order to cleanse it for the gift of salvation. 
The four kinds of tears, salt water, snow water, well water, and dew water, are carefully structured and as much intellectual as they are emotional. They're not the overflowing, abundant tears that can strike a true Christian heart at any time and in any place, but highly sophisticated tears, which lead immediately to eternal life for the proper Christian who sheds them. So, what would Richard do next? Well, he would probably dig out his copy of Laomi and try to overlay pages right, right, left, and center. Luckily, Margaret Lang actually published a recent art article talking about the language and the dating of both the Lambeth homilies and the Trinity homilies. So she <coughs> argues that the Lambeth homilies, written about 1200, follows Sizem, and she notes that the differences in language used by the single scribe of the first 18 items coincide with the beginnings and ends of the individual sermons and fit the language of both the present predecessor texts and this manuscript, she fits the Lambeth homilies provisionally in Northwest Worcestershire. It's very specific, which is useful. Um, her pictogram, and it's a really complicated pictogram, so I did not replicate it, of the dimensions of the scribe demonstrates, as she puts it, one man representing one place at two different times. Unlike Swan, but like Hannah, Lang argues for this scribe as working literatum and just faithfully copying his exemplars, which themselves represented local modifications of the texts they included. This scribe is no reviser, no careful reworker of these texts. The Trinity homilies, on the other hand, which are earlier, even though that's a more expanded version of this little treatise, generally preserved as written earlier towards the end of the 12th century, she says that the Trinity homilies are created, actually what she says is they're, they're created in the last quarter of the 13th century, so I think that's a typo. Um, and uh, what she argues is that the manuscript is the work of someone she calls a capital T translator and a capital L literatum scribe, that is one scribe in that manuscript willing to modify the language of the exemplar in the direction of the scribe's own linguistic expression, and one scribe who just copies the exemplar as it stands. So these two exchange stints unevenly and frequently in the Trinity homilies, not at the beginnings or ends of the 34 homilies, or even at a change of folio. Um, the first, then there's also a third scribe at the end. The first two scribes worked from exemplars for the other 33 homilies in the poem of Morale that were similar but distinct. Um, and they were, she argues, from the East Midlands, likely in two different hands. At homilies 23 and 24, and our homilies number 25 in the Trinity homilies, a shift in linguistic usage may coincide with a change in exemplar. So her results are relatively complex for the Trinity homilies, and I think what I'm going to do is summarize them to say that basically she thinks they're from Suffolk. Um, so we've got, on the one hand, Northwest Worcestershire for the Lambeth homilies, just after 1200, and on the other hand, solidly the East Midlands, she says Suffolk before 1200. I think I can skip something here, so I'm going to. No, I can't. Sorry. <laughs> um, so I move on to my next uh, scholar um, trying to deal with these homilies. Um, Sandra McIntyre, in a chapter which elucidates the patristic tradition concerning the role of tears in Christian penitence, quotes Gregory the Great on the tears shed in humility. These are, for Gregory in the Moralia, the tears of snow water. So we've actually located snow water, it's Gregory. Um, these tears of humility lead directly, as they do in the Lambeth and Trinity treatise, to salvation. McIntyre in this chapter uses Gregory at some length to clarify the role of tears, which must be genuine and penitential. Several chapters later, though, she doesn't appear to see the link to this treatise when she discusses this, um, this material, um, when she talks about the Middle English perception of tears as doctrine and piety, whereas in the Old English period, she sees tears as associated with doctrine and theology. Don't really get that. Um, in fact, McIntyre predates Swan in a readily perceptible desire to link this little text to pre-conquest material. And quoting her. In the 12th century, we see the traditional elements following the Anglo-Saxon emphases. Lambeth homily 25, she actually means Trinity, um, and she quotes it, is a veritable compendium of patristic thought on the doctrine of tears. 
In other words, McIntyre uncovers the patristic exegesis which lies behind the tears of snow water, cleaning the soul and preparing it for salvation. Unfortunately, she doesn't link her discovery with her discussion of this treatise. In a sense, she's not wrong that Gregory was a favorite exegete in Anglo-Saxon England, but there are no references surviving from the period on this particular point. So come to my last scholar, you'll be thrilled to know. Bella Millet, in two articles, considers both the Trini Trinity and Lambeth homilies, and she places them in a significantly broader context. She argues that these five texts in both manuscripts are without question post-conquest productions. And she further argues that they are in absolutely no way backward looking, although their manuscript context might suggest a pastoral tradition in the sense that they were copied into these manuscripts for use by a local preacher. She insists that all five of these texts are modern in style and that their connections are with the scholastic sermon tradition and quite possibly with Latin model sermons, such as those in Alan of Lille, Alexander of Ashby, and Thomas of Chabo. These five texts, she argues, have Latin elements whose sources are yet to be traced. Some even have traces of instructions to the preacher. So Millet is in no doubt that these collect collections were material for a preacher to use publicly, not private devotional work. And in her second article, she emphasizes the disjuncture between Old English and Middle English homiletic prose, and she attempts to detonate the traditional notion that sermons continued across the pre-conquest divide stalwart soldiers of the Christian faith, while other texts and genres failed to breach. Um, <laughs> Uh, and there's, uh, there's more detail on exactly what she does in terms of the Latin homilies, but I think I'm better to jump past those. She finds a relatively close parallel to this sermon, the opening, two pages of it, in a sermon by Peter Comestor for All Saints Day. And it's in fact Peter Comestor who turned up when I had my war with the Patrologia Latina, and I went and looked up his dates, and I looked up the fact that the Trinity homilies are the third quarter of the 12th century, and that Peter Comestor wrote in the third quarter of the 12th century in Paris, and I thought, must have gotten that wrong. Couldn't possibly have been written in Latin in Paris in the third quarter of the 12th century, and then got translated into English, newly translated into English um, at the same time, or shortly thereafter, so I, that's why I thought it was nuts. Um, but it turns out I wasn't nuts. nuts. Although I kind of like thinking of Peter Comestor as Peter the Insatiable. It's <laughs> not tired of that. So the Lambeth Trinity homily clearly reworks the material a great deal out of Peter Comestor, but the basic fourfold distinction of kinds of tears is present. Comestor speaks of four kinds of the bread of tears, depending on four causes of weeping. And this is the distinctio at work in the first half of the sermon, and the one which underlies the fanciful and sophisticated summarizing distinctio of the four waters of tears. Though sadly, Peter Comstor does not talk about the four waters of tears. So the snow, salt, dew, and, and one that I've forgotten now. Um, we well, still don't well, know the origin. Well, well. well thank you. <laughs> so um, <coughs> basically, to jump to my conclusion, for some years now then, the trend in the field of medieval studies has been away from studying a single text and its implications in favor of a holistic consideration of a manuscript. Um, nonetheless, it's still possible, or perhaps it's again possible, making use of the scholarly studies now available in the material culture of these texts to see how a particular small treatise written in a manuscript just before and just after the year 1200 might have links to a broad range of cultural currents and cross currents. It seems unfortunate to me anyway that this particular exegesis of tears was lost to posterity it offers both a charming image and a sophisticated interpretation. Moreover, it could be argued that the rush to see continuity and connection between pre-conquest and post-conquest vernacular usage in English has actually obscured a much more interesting piece of evidence. Clearly, this treatise, and presumably its four companions in the Lambeth and Trinity homilies, represents a new translation into early Middle English, almost certainly produced in the third quarter of the 12th century. This new sermon was copied into two manuscripts of the Midlands, Far West and Far East, well, Far West and Far East in England, um, within about 25 years, perhaps considerably less time of the time at which the translation from Peter Comestor took place. We have in these texts evidence for composition in an early Middle English 
but looks sufficiently like late Old English that it suggests to Anglo-Saxonists a lost pre-conquest origin for the material. And at the earliest, these texts are 20 years after. The, sorry, at the earliest, these texts are 20 years after the last transitional English entry in the Peterborough Chronicle. In many respects, we've come full circle back to the quiet parenthetical remark made by Celia Sizem in the first serious article about these texts. Some, she said, were perhaps translated from Latin in the 12th century. <laughs> the language of continuity is against rupture does not well explain this material. And I think I'm going to put that. <laughs>